Hi everyone, my name is Alice Grundy and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Digital Writers Festival event this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be talking about editing and how editors are invisible, uh, what are the ethics of editing as writers and for editors. Uh, this has partly come about a follow-on from a project that um, I'm doing with Elizabeth Tan for the festival on a story Elizabeth has written called Lola and Calliope. You can correct me on the pronunciation, Elizabeth, if I, I think it's that wrong. It, it's Kalliope. okay. Kalliope. Um, and we're joining poets Omar Saka and Caitlin Mailing. How do I go on your surname there, Omar? Uh, Saka. Saka, thank you. Um, so, introductions. Caitlin is a WA poet who's Conversations I've Never Had came out in 2015, and a follow-up collection, Border Crossing, is due out in February through Fremantle Press. Uh, Omar is an Arab-Australian poet who's been published in Contemporary Australian Poetry, Best Australian Poems 2016, Strange Horizons, Going Down Swinging, Overland, Mianjin, and others. And he was awarded the runner-up prize in this year's Judith Wright Poetry Prize. His debut collection, These Wild Houses, is coming from Cordite in 2017. Elizabeth is a writer from Perth, Western Australia, and a sessional academic at Curtin University. Her debut novel, Rubik, is due for release in 2017 with Brio, uh, which I'm publishing and I'm <laughs> delighted to be publishing. Thank you, Alice. So, welcome to each of you. Um, we're going to start, since this is a digital writers festival, uh, and the festival would like me to generally acknowledge First Nations people, but I thought we could also each talk about the land that we're on, uh, since each of us is in a different place. Most of us are in different places. Uh, so I'm on Gadigal land, I'm in Sydney, so the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to them and to the elders and their continued custodianship of this land. Um, Elizabeth, whereabouts are you? Um, so I would like to acknowledge the Wajak people who are the traditional custodians of this land from which I'm joining uh, this meeting. Yeah. Uh, Omar, where are you? Sorry? Omar, where are you now? Ah, where are you? I'm, which land are you on? Um, I'm in Footscray, which is home to the Woomerung and uh, Boonwurrung tribes of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay respects to uh, their elders past and present and to any elders um, or their descendants who are watching on their sovereign lands. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin, where are you? Uh, same as you, in Sydney, on Gadigal land, uh, so I'd like to acknowledge, again, the elders past and present of the Aura Nation and all others watching on their traditional lands. Thank you all. Um, okay, so um, now that we've placed ourselves and we've introduced ourselves, uh, I thought it'd be good for each of you to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing. And I'm a participating chair in this session, so I'll be contributing a little bit too. So, Caitlin, how about we start with you? Can you tell me a bit about your practice um, and how editing figures into it? Oh. Um, well, I'm a poet, so I write pretty much every day. And I think editing is useful to me as getting information both from other writers on how they write, and feeding that into my practice, but also allowing me to contribute to the community. So I like to send out really, really, really rough drafts and get feedback on that pretty much immediately. Like I'm not precious about my work. So I think with Omar, I'll often send him things and be like, this is really shit or this is really weird. Is there anything here? And he'll be able to tell me if there's anything there or if I should just pretty much dump it. So that's, yeah. that tends to be working for me. <laughs> You're good. So Omar, how about you? Um, yeah, like like Caitlin, um, I write fairly often. Um, I wouldn't say every day, but I'm I'm fairly prolific. Um, and editing plays plays a big part in my work. I, I am always editing poems. I feel I rarely ever like to settle um, poems that I wrote three years ago. I feel I'm still editing now, um, and. Reading aloud is, is a big part of that process, but also getting feedback from um, my contemporaries like Caitlin is, is also very important to me. 
Um, also, I don't think I've ever told her to dump a poem. <laughs> Very good. Elizabeth, what about you? Um, yeah, I tend to um, have a difficulty distinguishing between the acts of editing and writing because to me they both are, um, they both are the work and they both um, uh, enable the work to come to fruition. So I tend to write and self-edit simultaneously. Um, and um, so for this reason, I'm quite a slow writer um, and I tend to sit on ideas for a long time before I commit them to the page. Um, and yeah, it's kind of important to me to be as precise as possible from the get go, especially with punctuation and sentence structure and things that will affect the reader's uh, understanding um, of my work and the rhythm and the melody of my work, I guess. And so in that sense, I would like to try to be accountable to an audience from the get go. Um, and I also, I guess I find that once I commit words to the page, it becomes harder to change them once they're there. Like um, there's only so many changes I can do before um, the words kind of become set in my mind. So um, yeah, it's important for me to like um, throw down words and um, edit them as I, as I write um, and yeah, and, and um, like Omar and uh, Caitlin have said, like seeking feedback from others is important to me too. And that, that helps me figure out whether my um, intentions are coming across and also it can help me clarify my intentions if my readers can spot things that I haven't spotted. Um, yes. <laughs> hmm. um, I don't write very often, uh, partly because when I became an editor, I found it nearly impossible to do. I know some people manage to do both, but uh, for me, being an editor as my day job means that I, I basically can't write. Um, but I wrote a piece recently, um, oh, occasionally I write uh, essays or nonfiction pieces, and I have the exact opposite process to you, Elizabeth. I have to hammer it out and give as little conscious thought to it as possible because otherwise I just would never ever finish a draft because I'm just way too self-conscious and um, self-critical and can't even get a sentence down without despising it. So <laughs> speed is key for me uh, and revision is really important. Um, but I'm interested in this idea of beta readers as a kind of uh, second editor. So in a way, the author or the writer is the first editor in revising their work. Uh, and then the beta or the first readers send your work to. And I'd be interested to know how you find beta readers and um, how you come to trust them. Uh, I'd just at this point like to say you can follow along with the hashtag DWF16 at home and um, we'll be throwing it open to you for questions at the end. But back to the topic of beta readers, um, Caitlin, how did you find Omar as a beta reader and, um, and how did that relationship develop over time? Um, we were in the same kind of uh, workshop that uh, the lovely Judy Beveridge was running with some of her past and present students at University of Sydney. I don't, I don't really know. We were Facebook friends and we'd write to each other about poems and then at some point Omar's quite like he'd be like, I forget, we'd email poems to the overall class group and at some point maybe you took one that I emailed and was like I fixed it for you <laughs> <laughs> and I was like <laughs> but <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm just characterizing but <laughs> be like that um but I'm I don't have a problem with I guess I'm lucky trusting beta readers. Like I'm quite happy once the poem's down to just be like, hey, whatever you want to do. And that's the same with Omar or anyone else that reads my work, any editors I send it to, if they come back with, I'd like you to change these things. I'm like, sure, whatever. Like I'll have final say on how it goes into my actual collection finally. But like, I'm always interested in what people have to say. And after that initial thing, we just started emailing back and forth, I guess maybe like once a week poems. Yeah. yeah. 
Omar, would you like to correct the record or did you actually say I fixed it? <laughs> um, look, I think, I think she may have been right. But in my defense, in my defense, I guess, I'm, I'm only ever moved to uh, send an edit through to someone when the work is um, really good. And like, I really like it, but I feel like it's just, you know what I mean? Like it has to be compelling enough to warrant me actually putting myself out there and saying, I think this might be a little bit, you know, look at this. This is a suggestion, obviously, but yeah. Um, I don't know if I use the words fixed to God. I hope. I <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I think that's, that's kind of generally how it, how it started. And um, it's, it's been great because with other poets that I that I know or that I, I used to um, mailed workshop thing going, they weren't as prolific as me, and I would always feel bad because I felt like I was sending like a lot more work out than I was receiving, so that the balance was not quite skewed. Was 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 a bit skewed, but. Um, with Caitlin, since we both write fairly often, it doesn't feel that way and we can just bounce off of each other. And I also feel like we have a very, uh, we're similar in a way in our fixations and uh, the things that we, we write about and the poems that we like. Um, so yeah, we're, we're a good fit as, as far as the, the writing and the, the editing is concerned. Hmm. Elizabeth, do you have many in the way of beta readers? Um, and can you talk a little bit about the way working on a creative work as part of a PhD involves a different kind of beta reading? Yeah. Um, so basically there are, there are two people in my life who I can generally always rely on to read my drafts, and I've met them both um, at Curtin. Um, when we're all an undergrad together. Um, the first is Erin Pierce, um, who's probably best known for her contribution to the Fremantle Press anthology, The Kid on the Karaoke Stage. And the second is Eva Bialko, who also is one of my colleagues at Curtin. And she was most recently published, I think, in Yanjin. Um, and Eva and I both did our PhD simultaneously. Um, so I kind of have a reciprocal, um, I guess, feedback kind of relationship with Ever and Erin and um, um, I'm, um, we're all kind of familiar with each other's work and um, sometimes we write in the same space. Um, and yeah, it's, um, I feel really blessed to, um, yeah, to have found my people like um, through uni and um, and especially because um, workshopping in, um, in, in our undergraduate units was so key. Um, and so when I um, send work to Erin or Ever and I get it back, um, they, yeah, they'll just uh, bring so much insight. And I find that really helpful um, when it comes to like revisiting and then uh, re-editing. Um, but yeah, well, while doing the PhD, um, I, um, well, my supervisor, uh, Deborah Hahn, would uh, read, like, most of my drafts. Um, I would um, send them to her, like, ahead of time, um, and then we'd meet up, and then she'd sort of make notes and tell me what she thought. And um, I found that um, I was very bad at kind of responding face-to-face -face in the moment uh, to, her, to her thoughts, and I would kind of have to scuttle away to a dark corner and... Um, revisit the, um, my drafts and um, yeah, then come back with a, with a new draft kind of thing. So, um, and I guess that's kind of stayed with me. Like um, when we work, when we work together, um, Alice and how in your emails, you're always like, you can give me a call if you want to discuss these changes, but I don't know if I could actually do that. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I don't know how I could have a conversation about, about yeah about changing the work because i need to it's so it's so interior for me i need to um be in my safe space of blankets and stuff and <laughs> um yeah i'm not sure if that answers that speaks to your question um as precisely as you wanted but yeah <laughs> no that answers my question um the it's i mean editing your work elizabeth is uh 
it, it makes me feel a little bit slack, I have to say, because I don't have to do terribly much. <laughs> uh, and especially in the case of the book, because it had already been part of your uh, the creative component of your PhD. In some cases, creative components of PhDs need a lot of work before they're the kind of thing that's ready to be published as a book because often there are different intentions behind books that are sold in the world and uh, books that are written as in the case of Rubik, there was not really <laughs> that much in editing. And in the Lola story that um, we have up on the Digital Writers Festival, when we were deciding uh, which story to use for the project, uh, Elizabeth, you sent me through two stories. And one of them, I just thought, there's no way we can use this for the project because it was just effectively done. <laughs> I had maybe a couple of things that I could have suggested to do with um, very, very, very minor word substitutions or maybe a slight tweak to punctuation, but it was so precise and so well written and, you know, the humour was bang on and I just thought, we can't put this up because then people will say, what the hell are editors doing? <laughs> they don't, they don't oh. have a job. Um, Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> no, it's a good thing. Um, so we, I, I chose the other story because at least I thought that I had something to contribute to that one. And I think that's something as an editor you have to know where your are, and there are times that um, I don't think that I'm the best person to respond to something or I'm best placed uh, when it comes to rejecting submissions, whether it's for Seizure, the literary journal that I edit, or if it's um, book projects, sometimes I'm rejecting something because I don't think I'm the right advocate for that work or I don't think that I know how to develop the work in order to get it to be its best self. Um, so I think sometimes maybe people think that's just a line <laughs> that that an editor might spin, but it, I think it's a legitimate reason. Uh, and I guess something I wanted to talk a little bit about is the education of editors and whether you feel as though when you're working on something for publication, if you feel as though you need to educate the editor uh, on specific things. Uh, for instance, I was talking to an Aboriginal writer not long ago who wanted to include words in language in a story. And um, the editor said that they wanted to have translations and the writer said, I want the words as is, I don't want translations. So it was a negotiation process of trying to, of in fact the writer educating the editor in that case and explaining why uh, they didn't want to have the translations in that way. Uh, so I was wondering if, if any of you would like to talk about educating editors and um, and how that works and sort of pushing back. Um, um, do we start with Omar? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I I don't know if I would use the word educating, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think it's important to push back. Um, for me, I'm a fairly, let's say. Uh, hands-on editor um, and the reason for that is uh, not because I demand that what I like be reflected in the work but because in pushing I want the writer to push back I specifically want them to say this cannot change um, and as soon as as soon as that happens as soon as I know what's essential to them in the poem, then I feel I can do a better job emphasizing that um, or, or, or making it clearer. Um, so I, I have done that as as a writer with um, editors when I'm when I ask for things to change in a poem that um, uh, re reference my uh, Arabic heritage, for example, or reference where I grew up, or you know things that they might think are are meaningless but actually have heavy meaning um, for, for whatever reason. And then back, but I, I don't, um, but I think that's a necessary part of the process. I think something can be gained in the, the push and the pull. I think so too. And, and that comes back to the question of trust as well. Um, having a trusted relationship with an editor makes all the difference because it means that you're happy to contradict them and they to contradict you and then you can have it out <laughs> rather than <laughs> being overly polite. And... 
sweeping it under the carpet. Um, Elizabeth, how how have um, have you felt in terms of editor? Um, I mean, you've been published in a few literary journals, and um, so you've worked with a few different editors in yeah. a sort of one-on-one -on -one story basis. How does that work for you? Um, well, I think like Caitlin, I tend not to be super precious about um, about my work. Um, I think um, in a, in a, in um, in a really big way, uh, workshopping at university has helped has kind of prepared me for um, editor relationships because I think it's through the cumulative um, experiences of workshopping that I've managed to hone an instinct for when to stick to my guns or when to yield to an editor's expertise. Um, but um, uh, I. Um, for, like with your um, your edit on Lothar and Calliope, um, like I, f I find that kind of edit like quite typical for a story of that length and that um, and I mean it's not a particularly complex story, so like um, yeah, I kind of I'm kind of I guess used to that level of um, yeah, someone querying my expressions and um, uh, not really requesting too many structural changes. Um, because I've, I've kind of already put a lot of work into self-editing and like uh, beta reading, um, especially with Erin and Eva. So um, I'm not sure if that speaks to your question, but um, <laughs> yeah, I um, I think I'm, I don't one tend of the to things, push back very much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it, it, one of the things in your work is there are a lot of um, cultural references, pop culture references, but also to different kinds of things, uh, particularly in Rubik. Uh, so some of the stories have appeared, for instance, in Overland and elsewhere. Um, do you ever feel as though you have to educate editors on where the references are coming from and how they're functioning? Um. Not really, not more than I would like a um, like a beta reader, I guess. Like it, um, I find that helpful information actually when um, when someone doesn't understand a reference, um, it it helps me to I guess communicate better um, and yeah, think of ways to uh, signal signal what a cultural reference is. Um, so that um, it could be read by uh, someone who's not initiated. Um, but yeah. Um, I, and oh, sorry, keep going. Oh, um, no, I had nothing. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, that's all right. Uh, Caitlin, do you, how, do, how has it been for you? Do you, do you feel as though you have to um, build understanding with editors for your work and the push and the pull, how has that played out for you? Um, it's actually been really interesting because working with my primary editor on actually pulling together my collections. So the downside about being prolific and not precious is that I am not like Elizabeth and very, I'm not precise. And so I, uh, yeah, my editor was always like, your punctuation's inconsistent. And Omar's sometimes like that as well. He's like, why is there not this thing here? And I'll be like, I don't know. I just didn't think it <laughs> And so my editor was like, no, you need to think about grammar and how you're using grammar and what it actually means to you because you're a poet and you need to have, like, feelings about this. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so then I had to force to articulate those things. And that's actually something I overall like about the editing relationship. And I think there's something I go back to. I forget what poem it was of Omar's, but we... There was one where I was just like, no, there's, you need to cut all this out because here's the heat and, like, I want the, just this heat bit and you were arguing <laughs> for, like, uh, like the long lines and the dilatory effect and, like, a push-pull in a poem and I'm like, no, I want it to just essentially be like a sledgehammer and, like, <laughs> the different priorities that you can have in a piece of work and, like, I find that so interesting to actually learn that through editing somebody's work, how they approach that type of thing in poetry is cool. <laughs> yeah, and in poetry in particular, um, in, in 
some ways the focus is so much on things like punctuation and, and word choice. Um, is your grammar that's something that is that's based on instinct and and gut feeling, or is it something um, that you feel that you've learned over time, or you've been influenced by particular writers? Uh, it would just be gut feeling and instinct and laziness for me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Now it's just trying to standardise it and be as simple as possible and go through and think about, is this readable? So I guess I did have to think about how I was using grammar and how accessible I was making my work and actually think about the reader, which I guess is something you should do as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, Omar, where does your sense of language and, and grammar and sort of wordplay come from? Is it is it mostly instinct or is it something that you have um, shifted over time? Um, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's mostly instinct. I don't uh, think about it too much. I don't know before a poem begins um, whether my register will be high or whether it will be low. I don't know if I'm going to be... Um, writing a poem in the kind of slang that I heard growing up or that is still used by um, my cousins, for example, um, or if I'm going to, you know, essentially sound on the page like an old white man. I, I don't, I don't actually know. Um, kind of happens on the page and then afterward I, I look at it and I go, does it need to, do I need to play? Do I need to shift between these two? Um, you know, what's what's going on here and, and how can I um, make it of a piece, make it all sing together? Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's certainly not um, a, a calculated choice beforehand. And how, how did the workshopping in an academic context um, play into that process? Do you think it, it had an effect on the way that you work or we, or was it something that was introduced and then you needed to shut out as well? Um, how did the academic process affect it? Uh, am um, I right in thinking that you studied poetry with um, Judy Beveridge, is that right? Yes, I, I did, but uh, <laughs> I don't, hmm. I didn't really take too much away from that in terms of uh, my own writing, if that makes any sense. That's not what I want to say. It's like, I've, I feel like I, I came into poetry via um, spoken word and, and slam. I feel like seeing that and hearing that accessible for me and I needed to come in that way. The, mm -hmm. the epic, the academic or, or formal elements of poetry that I was introduced to came later and didn't really shape my work um, as 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 much. I feel, um, but it, it certainly did have an impact. But I don't know. I mean, it's still relatively recent for me, so I'm not really sure how to how to measure that. But I mean, talking about things like register. Um that's different from slam because with slam poetry, it, it would, it's more likely it would be in one register. Whereas you're saying that your written poetry, it may be high, it may be low, uh, depending on the content and the context of the poem. Is that, do, did I understand that right? Yes, you understood that right. But I think there's a, there's a difference between slam and spoken word. Okay. Um, in, in that word, poetry can be more than um the the slam form it can tell a story with words it can in fact shift registers it can do more than just be the kind of um self-aggrandizing um <laughs> often associated with slam um <laughs> you know i think that um there are storytellers in the spoken word um like luca lesson for example and um like um Kate um, Tempest and uh, Anas Mojgani and people like this who, who play with the, the form. And I've, I learned as much um, from them as, as I did from um, Philip Levine, for example. 
Good. Um, Elizabeth, from what you were saying before, it sounded as though um, things like grammar play a part in your process from the beginning. Can you talk about how it came into your um, consciousness, I suppose, uh, and, and how it plays out in your writing? Um, I guess I, ca I care a great deal about being precise with punctuation and grammar and sentence structure and stuff, and not for the sake of correctness, but for the sake of clarity. And it's, again, that kind of trying to be accountable to an audience from the get-go. Um, because, I mean, when I'm, when I'm writing, I, I mean, it's, it's an act of communication and um, I want to be understood. And I guess, um, yeah, for me, it's, it's part of the act of, um, of, being a, of being a writer to um, think about how my words are being received and trying to make it as easy as possible for the reader to understand. Um, yeah, understand my work, I guess. Yeah. But ease of understanding is not the only thing at play. Um, mm, that's for true. Instance, things like uh, playing with sentence structure or it's almost like a cinematographer and camera angles. You can mm. use uh, grammar and, and the way that you structure your sentences to, to shift the reader's experience. That's true, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, no, I agree with you. Yeah, like it's part, um, mm, so it's like as, as well as um, uh, making sure that the reading experience is clear for the reader, I guess it's also about, um, I guess, being, being loyal or authentic to my own voice as well, I guess. And um, yeah, so it's a kind of, um, it's yeah, it's both those things, I guess, and um, and like I guess ensuring rhythmically that uh, my work is coming across the way that I intend. I guess I'm not sure if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so <laughs> I always need reassurance from Alice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I should have a stamp that I can just put all of your remarks. <laughs> My, my last question um, before I open it up to uh, viewers, if you guys. Are. This question um, before I do that is about technology, and it's it's a fairly sort of practical question, and the drafting process and things like track changes or um, using comment in PDF. Or um, I'm particularly interested for the poets. Do you draft on paper and then transfer it to your computer? Are you computer from the beginning? Uh, Caitlin, how how does what kind of technology do you use, uh, and how do you use it? Uh, I am paper first, and then type up, and then if I'm editing, that's when I'll use the computer. In general, though, um, so with Omar it tends to be electronic editing, but with my actual, like my um, manuscript editor, uh, they would print out my draft and do all of their changes in pencil on it of the entire manuscript and then hand me back physically the manuscript with all the pencil suggested changes as opposed to a word document so that was always interesting <laughs> but um now i like track changes and I, especially for poems because then you can just mess with the actual layout which is so important to a poem in its editing as well like be able to shift up the lineation that like that's where technology comes in for me it's interesting i've um talked to some poetry editors who are very unhappy with the advent of word processing because it means that when you come to typeset a book the standard size for poetry books is based on the idea of people writing in notebooks effectively but with a four pages it just doesn't fit very so you have to, with the typesetter, to try and make it make sense. Uh, and I know some poets who actually set up the files in their computer so that it's A5 size, so that they can actually have a sense of how it will look on a printed page before it goes to the editor. So that's an option if you want it. Okay, cool. <laughs> but, um, 
it, it depends. And, you know, for some poems, it's more, it's more crucial and for others, it's less crucial whether they're a run on lines or not. But Omar, are you a pen and paper kind of guy? Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes I write, well, not sometimes, most times I write um, on Word um, using my laptop and sometimes I write with pen and paper. There is a marked difference with the poems that I start um, on, on the page. Um, but in saying that, um, I, I just do whatever feels right in, in the moment. Um, I think writing on the page with pen and or pencil is really useful. It's like you can get a, an easy second draft when you start with the, the computer. You just edit out the, the bits you don't need. Um, so it's a useful shortcut as well. Um, but, but I, yeah, I, I track changes um, with Kent and at Cordite. Um, on, we just exchanged um, edits on the manuscript using the PDF and comment on it, which was kind of frustrating as, as a process, um, but works as well. So, yeah. And when you're editing Caitlin's work, do you always do it on screen or do you ever print it out and scribble? Uh, never print it out, um, but that's mostly because I don't have a printer. <laughs> if I did, maybe, maybe I would. But look, Caitlin is a great poet, so it, doesn't, it really doesn't require much. Um, for me, it's just sort of like I can see it fairly immediately. Um, whether there's something that's just slightly um, out of line or just slightly unnecessary, and then I can go, yeah, the, here, here's what I think. Um, I do actually print out all of Omar's poems most of the time and then write on yeah. them and then have to type up my changes, apart from <laughs> at National Young Writers <laughs> Festival where I rocked up day one with, like, five of his poems with, like, pencil-written notes on them, and I'm like, here you go, and he was like... <laughs> I cannot understand anything that you have written. <laughs> Is that, it? that means it's good. <laughs> yes. I, I think increasingly as people don't have printers at their houses anymore, we'll, we'll all just end up doing it um, digitally. Do you, um, when you're drafting, do you print things out and scribble on them or are you mostly digital? Me? Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. Oh, oh me, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm mostly digital, I guess. I, um, I like to write on my laptop in bed. Um, and, um, but I guess sometimes when I want to, I guess, defamiliarise myself a little bit, I will um, um, go to uni and print it out and um, make marks on the page. Um, yeah, I kind of, yeah, sometimes it's good to switch it up, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, but, what, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say when I'm editing, I like to do at least one version of each. Uh, normally, most of the work will be done in uh, on screen, and generally, I mean, it's it's partly because I I feel as though it's a waste of trees printing stuff out over and over again. Mm. Um, but it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be when I worked primarily on illustrated titles everything out of these huge color a3 sheets <laughs> and then somebody would steal something from the printer and you'd lose pages and you'd have to reprint it and it was just <laughs> the poor trees that I killed but I feel oh. as though you do, you do see different things uh, depending on whether you're reading on screen or on the page and um, it's one of my favorite moments of, is sending pages to an author after it's been typeset because it really does change the way that it looks or even more fun um elizabeth you can tell me what you think but when we do reading copies of a book and it suddenly looks like an actual physical book for the first time yeah yeah um i'm i'm actually reading through um my reading copy of rubik at the moment and i've like got queries to like send to you at a later date but yeah um definitely you do spot different things when um yeah, um, when it's on the printer page and when it's typeset, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and specifically um, in that book, because there are different stories that are typeset in slightly different ways, then there have to be these negotiations. Uh, and that happens all the time with poetry. There was, um, I, when I was at Giramondo, we published a book by Kate Middleton, and she had created a certain punctuation mark, which was six spaces. Uh, and she could tell it by eye because she had, <laughs> she'd done it so carefully. And there were a few occasions where I sneakily had deleted one or two spaces to try and fit something on a line to avoid a run on line. And she could tell just by looking at it <laughs> that I had cheated. So I had to find other solutions to not do away with her um, unique six space punctuation line. Brilliant. <laughs> But that's that's the kind of that's the kind of fun that you have with poetry that you have to you have to be flexible uh, mm -hmm. and and come up with different solutions because it's a it's a different kind of process and punctuation can yeah. often mean different things. So mm -hmm. I think that um, it's a little bit quiet on the interwebs and um, we, we don't have any questions. Yeah. Um, we were talking about uh, editing on the micro level but something that I wonder about often is editing on the macro level as in how do you decide what to include in a manuscript mm. um, this is just me I'm literally just wondering um, what you guys think about um, especially in negotiating with an, with an editor um, as to, to what to include in it in its shape um, in its in its overall structure, do you think about that? Does it not matter, mm. etc.? Well, I can just respond on a couple of fronts. In in one sense, there's a practical question of how many pages a book has, and um, even though print costs have come down, extent has an impact on price. Uh, but it also there are certain conventions in place. So for poetry there are conventions about how long a poetry book is so as arbitrary as that may sound one of the considerations is length um, but I think also things like ebb and flow and uh, the overall structure and also what the book's trying to achieve so for instance if it's a very political collection it, it may um, benefit from having some poems that aren't as political to interrupt the flow or to add a shift in tone or something like that. So that might be a case for increasing the number of poems in a, in a collection. Or, or vice versa, if you want it to be much more strictly and um, um, to, to fit a certain genre or a certain goal more tidily, then you might take out those things. But, but I feel as though for every single book it's a, it's a negotiation and a process um, that has to be made between the writer and the editor. Uh, Caitlin, you're going through this at the moment. What do you think? Um, well, I've just been through it. For me, it's actually weirdly like a lot about tone and what overall tone I want the book to set. So often I'll be like, is this too dark? Like, is there need for more light in this? And that's often where, like, you're talking about inserting less political poems into a political collection. I will think about like what is missing from the wide panoply of human experience that can be captured by poetry that I can that, that I can put into this and then it's about again this is actually where I do think about the reader like what is the reading experience that I want my reader to get from this overall book in terms of ordering them um, and then there will be a few poems that I'll go to the mat for if someone wants to pull out and then it's other ones, my worst fear is that I will have submitted a manuscript and then realise that I hate one of the poems a lot and then my editor will be like, no, that's the poem we need to have in there and I'll be like, no, that's a terrible poem, take it out. And then it is forever. But that hasn't happened so much yet. But I would, I, would, I think I would just, that would be where I would be like, okay, no, I'm not having a book anymore because there's a terrible poem. <laughs> If, if you talk to graphic designers, um, it's a common experience where they might intentionally put a dud in a set of designs that are sent to an author or whoever to try and encourage them to go towards 
their favorite design. But this is a very dangerous path because <laughs> precisely what you're saying could happen. And the author might say, I love that one. And then you, then you have to have a big fight about why it's a terrible cover, even though you sent it to them. So, so yes, buyer beware on that one. Um, Elizabeth, in terms of um, selecting your book is both a novel and a collection of short stories in a way. Um, can you talk about inclusion and exclusion? Um, well, um, I guess like um, going back to earlier in our conversation um, when we we're talking about trust and stuff, I guess um, um, I guess, well, I mean, for this is my first collection that I've um, that I'm having published, so um, I don't have much else to refer to. But I guess when um, when we were talking about uh, removing, possibly removing two of the stories, um, I I guess because I trusted your opinion, Alice. Like I um, I yeah, it, it, and it felt more. It's like you said, like it's, it was more of a negotiation or a conversation um, rather than a you must cut or this. And um, so I guess because I felt like I was able to have my say, like I was a bit, I was not so precious about if, the, if those two stories like were not part of the collection anymore. I could just kind of say, here's what I think, um, here's what, why um, these stories are significant to me and I could, yeah, just be open to like, yeah, just yeah, hearing what you thought in response to my response, I guess. Yeah. Omar, would you like to answer your own question? <laughs> uh, I don't really I don't have I don't have an answer. It's just um something that's that's been on my mind as I'm um heading toward putting a second collection together. Um, how much of a theme do I want really? Uh, how much variety um, the things are just there, they're on my, my mind. Um, of, uh, my, my first collection, I think Kent um, wanted a couple that I had in the manuscript out and I didn't, and he had good reasons for it and I, I accepted it. And the reasons were mostly like, um, I think you're you're doubling up on this this sentiment. So this poem feels unnecessary. Um, you know, basically you've already done it. So why why do it again? Um, and that kind of thing. It just 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 tighten it up. Um, mm. So that, that made sense to me. Um, yeah, I was just thinking in, in general. Um, I think it's expected of a poetry collection that it have a running theme. Um, that it builds to something. I don't know if this has always been the case, um, but you know, I kind of like the idea of also just having a set of poems as as wide and as varied and as strange and as eclectic as you want them to be, without needing to have some kind of narrative structure attached to it, right? Like I just how possible that is, or, or even how regular today. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I feel as though there's possibility, particularly in poetry collections, because you have the option of chat books, which can be more um, specific or refined or um, or focused in terms of their scope. And then a book can be more wide ranging. Um, I definitely think it's possible to have a collection that's not explicitly themed, but it's always that difficulty when it comes to things like reviews and prizes, which um, poetry is still very much in, engaged with even if it's a sort of fraught relationship but in order to do well in reviews and in prizes I think it's easier both for judges and for reviewers to have those little hooks that they can um, that they can attach to and then it makes it easier to describe and to um, argue Market. for or ingest or yeah so um, and, you know, novels are a slightly or nonfiction, um, whether it's an essay collection or whether it's narrative nonfiction, 
the idea of inclusion and exclusion is obviously very important for them as well. And any time that you're doing a major structural edit on a longer piece of work, um, it's a similar negotiation with the author about what stays in, what comes out, questions of repetition and rhythm uh, and the overall structure. So, yeah, it's the same conversation, even though the forms are quite different. So I think um, while I'm hedging and, um, and saying, <laughs> saying things that are probably patently self-evident, uh, it might be time to wind up the conversation. Um, but I'd like to say thank you to um, all three of the participants for talking about editing and for letting us see a little bit behind the curtain and their process and their ideas. And you'll be able to find links to their work on the Digital Writers Festival website. So thank you to Caitlin, to Omar, and to Elizabeth. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed watching. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>